Welcome to join our panel discussion this morning during InterSolar. My name is Walburga Hemmetsberger. I am the CEO of Solar Power Europe. For those who don't know us yet, Solar Power Europe is the European association representing the entire solar value chain. We have more than 250 members here in Europe. We have been invited, I've been invited, and also my, my dear panelists have been invited to by Trina to moderate uh, this panel discussion on the latest solar industry trends. Um, and it, as this is uh, provided to you by Trina, if you have any questions to Trina, please feel free to leave them a comment uh, in the, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, or on Facebook. So then the Trina Solar team will answer you during the live Q&A session tomorrow. So I have the great pleasure here now to discuss and share experience with a very distinguished panel. Uh, and I would like to quickly introduce my panel to you. We have uh, Massimo Lombardi from NL Green Power, Head of Sustainability Ecosystem. Then we have uh, Jenny Chase, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Head of Solar uh, Analysis. We have uh, Andreas Gast, SMR, Solar Technology, Head of Sales uh, Central Europe. And then last but not least, Gonzalo de la Vigna from Trina Solar, Head of Europe. And I would like to jump right into the topic of climate change and sustainability. Uh, climate change, uh, there's no doubt, is a fact by now. We are experiencing more and more extreme weather conditions. We've seen re heavy rain and floods this summer in, in the central and, and, and western Europe. Parts of Belgium, where I'm living, uh, has been affected severely. Germany was devastated. At the same time, there are also wildfires in the south of Europe. And if this would not be enough, of, enough proof, uh, we've also had it black on white in the latest IPCC report. So we need to act now and we need to act fast. As Solar Power Europe, we are therefore calling for more ambition. So in, in the new regulatory framework, which we are currently discussing, at Brussels level, the Fit for 55, we are calling for a 45 renewables target up from the 32% uh, today. But I would like to hear from the companies first. We have three company representatives here today who are all active in solar. How do you see the role of solar energy going forward in Europe in, in fighting climate change? And I, you know, as I think this is a, a little bit of a too easy question, uh, I would also like to take it one step further uh, solar is already one of the most sustainable technologies, but you know, with more power comes more responsibility. Uh, there's also some work ahead still when it comes to CO2 footprint, biodiversity, just to name two. Um, we as Solar Power Europe have been issuing recently the first uh, solar sustainability best practice benchmark to help the industry identifying best practices in different sustainability areas. We're also working together with the European Commission on eco-design and eco-labeling, uh, looking into how, how to better measure and track CO2 footprint of our industry and so on and so forth. So uh, just a couple of examples of the work we are doing on sustainability. So I would like to know uh, from you, first of all, indeed, uh, what, what kind of role you see for solar to combat climate change, but then also what your organization is doing uh, in terms of sustainability, what are the, the, the priorities you're setting when it comes to sustainability? And I would like to start with you, Massimo, if you could give us, uh, share with us uh, and the audience your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, first of all, for inviting me to, to join uh, this panel. And thanks also for the question. As you are saying, uh, uh, now more than ever, we are living the effect of the climate change on our daily life. Uh, you were already mentioning that we have seen a devastating summer, in, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, according to the National Ocean and Atmosphere Associ Association, uh, July 2021 was the Earth's hottest month going back uh, uh, 142 years. We have seen on one side the U.S. coast of the U.S. and Canada roasting. Then we have seen huge rainfall causing deadly flooding across Germany and Belgium, and you were telling us about that. 
but we have seen also on on the other hand in august that was the turn of china in the Hubei province uh, they suffer a lot a lot of loss of lives for from flooding and we should understand that this change is happening faster and uh, in a less unpredictable and less predictable way uh, if we take a look to the last IPCC report, the, the UN Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, we clearly understood that the world is out of, off of track. Uh, in this report, we can easily understand that the planet will warm by 1.5 degrees in the next two decades if we do not take drastic moves to eliminate greenhouse uh, emissions. So, this contest is pushing the renewable. Uh, if we take a look to the European market, uh, uh, solar is booming, for instance. The new photovoltaic systems uh, that were installed uh, in the 2020 was about roughly of 18.2 gigawatts. So it means roughly 11% more compared to the previous year. And those in spite of the coronavirus pandemic. So it means that on, on one side, the renewable energy is perceived right now as the newer, greener, and probably better form of energy. But on the other side, in the near future, green won't be enough. So we, as a sector, uh, are going to be pushed to be more sustainable. And we should do that. And we should do that along the entire value chain, from the raw material extraction to the plant dismantling. So what we need is an in innovative approach. So we need to work as much as we can on the ecosystem approach. That's the reason why, and I'm jumping on the second part of the question, we as an Green Power recently promoted and launched together with other 16 players or experts of the energy sector, the Global Alliance for Sustainable Energy. The Global Alliance for Sustainable Energy is a global platform that has the aim to be holistic in the sense of the approach, so impacting not only on the technical side, but also on the environmental and social topics. In this alliance, we would like to harmonize as much as we can the existing KPI and metrics to better define what we mean for sustainable energy and then setting standards, targets. And once we have set those standards, we should define a proper action plan made of concrete actions to reach those standards. Then in the Alliance, we would like also to disseminate and activate collaboration frameworks, for instance, to facilitate the acceptance of this technology. Let's think for a while to the permitting processes. We already set within the Alliance four main priorities, net zero CO2 footprint, human rights, circular economy and circular design, and water footprint. But since the beginning, we thought of this Alliance not like an industry club. We engage scientists, industry, but also non-scientists, because we would like to have on board also people that, that can ask uncomfortable questions to the industry. And those people are going to be in fully integrated in the decision-making process of the Alliance. Just an example, we involved two worldwide students' associations, Student Energy, a youth climate leader, because we need them, we need their help, we need their contribution, we need to listen to their point of view. So at the end, uh, let, let me finish my, my, my speech saying that we think that initiatives like the Global Alliance could help to shift from an incremental approach to an exponential approach, because the time, as you were saying at the beginning, the time to act is now. So let, let me say that if you feel the same sense of urgency as we do join the Alliance because in this way we can really change the world. Thanks Massimo. So big role for solar and a call for all uh, the participants to join the Alliance uh, and to exactly. involve also uh, society at large actually in the discussion. Maybe we'll come to this point later on uh, still. I would like to, uh, to hand over to you Gonzalo. Uh, to uh, share your views on uh, the further development of solar against the background of the urgency of the climate urgency and uh, and sustainability. Sure. 
I will also thank you very much for, for having me here. I mean, indeed, uh, the climate change this year was quite dramatical. I mean, uh, what, what we saw in, in Germany, where I live and where I'm from. With the flooding and more than 100 casualties, the same in Belgium or similar, and then the, the, the fire in Spain and Greece, Italy, and all these places is quite scary and getting even getting worse. I couldn't agree more with Massimo. Good thing is that uh, Trina listened to Massimo, or at least to Anel. As Massimo knows, and probably most of the industry, I mean, we joined the Global Alliance of Sustainable Energy. We're actually one of the founding, I would say, companies. And we're very happy and proud that Enel thought of Trina when you drove this initiative, which we support 100%. So I'm really very happy that we are one of these companies that have the honor to participate and, and follow this call. Um, as a matter of fact, Trina, when you look at our history, Trina was founded um, 23, 24 years ago, and the reason for it was the, the Kyoto Conference. So our founder and CEO, Sagao, he took this as a, I want to say, as his view or as his life target, you know, to, to promote solar. I mean, when you go back, I mean, as, as Massimo said, right now, solar is good, but I mean, go back 24 years ago, where solar was just, I don't know how to call it, something for, for green people, for, you know, for freaks, you can say. And now, you know, it has developed to one of the main energy sources and will become even more and more, maybe one day even the main source we will see in 10, 20 years from now. We've done a lot over the last 20 years. We've delivered more than 70 gigawatt of modules um, with which you can produce more than 90 billion kilowatt hours of clean energy. Um, and this also helps to reduce CO2 emission by more than 90 million tons per year. I mean, this is quite uh, amazing. Also, we're doing our best to reduce our own greenhouse gas emissions. So since 2015, so over the last five years, we've been able to reduce in our manufacturing uh, our greenhouse gas emissions by almost 70%. I think this is quite, quite impressive. Also, when you look at uh, our manufacturing and the consumption of energy, our own Trina own projects in um, China, they generate a surplus of energy that covers our manufacturing and our R&D, R &D, and we still have a surplus of 400 million kilowatt hours. So we're quite, um, quite clean. We're doing our best to, to be clean on the manufacturing side. And uh, we have also joined um, SPTI, just as Massimo said, I mean, we're also doing the efforts there to fight against the, the threat of the increase of the temperature by 1.5 cents. So we're very pleased to be part of this initiative and also work in this regard. Th thanks a lot, Gonzalo. Very impressive figures. Uh, Andreas, over to you. How do you see the uh, see solar evolving as a uh, as an inverter manufacturer and uh, and also you know what uh, do you do on, on sustainability mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> let's say solar power uh, when i take germany as an example will play beside wind the major role in future in our energy production this means that when we look today to the german market we see around about 55 gigawatt installed when we really want to manage the energy transition, we need to come from 55 to around about 400 gigawatt of solar to be installed. And this means that, uh, let's say, we also need to take responsibility as an industry for, let's say, also a sustainable and reliable energy production and delivery. And this means that, let's say, our product system solutions need to be able to provide uh, inertia, ramp rate control, energy shifting, or also black start capacity, that this role needs to be taken by our industry to come away from coal and nuclear power as an example. Yeah, so this is, let's say, beside uh, sustainability, for me also an important factor we also need to discuss. But for sure, regarding your question, what are we doing for sustainability? So SMA is, I would say one of the most sustainable companies. So this year we had been awarded for the German Sustainability Award. We are under the 10 finalists. And yeah, we say under the 10 most sustainable companies in Germany. And sustainability for us means, uh, and I agree here to Massimo, this is 
products and processes. This is environment and energy. This are our employees, but also, and this is very important, the social responsibility also in our supply chain. And here, I think our industry still has also to do's, yeah? So coming to common standards so that finally also the end customer will be able to compare the products, uh, to really compare the products uh, which are provided in the market and to get an, an, yeah, to come to a decision which is really an, a sustainable product. And here I see that uh, we need to take also action uh, in our industry to move further on. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Jenny, you, you see, you know, there, there's uh, really not so much need uh, anymore to talk about uh, the role of solar, it seems. Uh, so everyone is jumping on the sustainability topic because it, it is a big topic going forward. And, uh, and that is something our industry will also be, be, you know, more and more looked at when it comes to sustainability. But let's look into the naked figures uh, of the further growth of, of solar, uh, except if you also want to add something to, to sustainability, because I do think it's a very, uh, very important topic and it, it would be interesting also to, to get your view on it. But I would like to, to look with you a little bit more into the future, because we've heard about the, the growth we've seen in the last years, exponential growth. Uh, will this growth continue? So let's look at the midterm future, 2025, 2020, uh, 2030, maybe first. And if we still have time, also a little bit longer term, um, 2050. Um, as, as Solar Power Europe, we are issuing the global market outlook every year uh, and also the European outlook since, since two years, where you know, we, we give an overview on, on the global solar market figures and, and trends. And you know, it just even if we are uh, the ones you know, who, are, uh, who, who have uh, quite, quite some know-how on, on the markets, it surprises us again and again how much solar is growing. Uh, we added almost 140 gigawatt last year globally in Europe 20 gigawatt. 144 um, gigawatts we make it globally last year. Yeah, so uh, so more than every every third power plant unit is installed, uh, which is installed 2020 globally comes from from solar. And you know we look for further into this exponential growth. Uh, at the same time, 70% of the power generation is still coming from fossils and, and nuclear. So where do you see the trend going, uh, you know, 2025, 2030, is solar still underestimated? That's a really good question. And I have to produce forecasts of this every quarter. So I think about it a lot. Uh, we, we reckon that there were about 144 gigawatts DC installed last year. And our current scenario is 191 gigawatts installed worldwide this year. I am currently freaking out because there's the commodity price has just spiked again and everything is so confusing. I don't think it will bring the solar market to a screeching halt, but what might happen is that some projects, um, particularly in the Middle East and China and maybe even Latin America could get delayed. And so I think there's a bit of a downside risk. However, I've seen this before, we very rarely overestimate solar build. So I'm going to deliberately drag my feet on cutting our forecasts until we have more clarity than just, oh no, the, the price of metal silicon and, and power and EVA has just spiked. And so, and some module makers are talking about 28 cents a watt this year. I think they'll be lucky, but um, the, the fact that they're trying to increase prices that much makes things pretty tricky. Um, just on, so BNF sees a huge role for solar in the future energy supply. We're expecting various European countries to get 50 to 70% of their electricity from solar by 2050. And most of our modeling comes up with something that's insufficient probably to prevent more than about 1.75 degrees of climate change. Um, we reckon that to be on track to, for a better, better future than that, we need to start installing about 455 gigawatts of solar and 500 gigawatts of wind every year from between now and 2030. And that's to be on track. We are not on track. Um, and we're also struggling to see the kind of exponential growth that would get us on track because the limitations to solar right now are not about, are not easily, bro are not easily um, achieved. 
by just scaling up factories. They're about finding grid connections. They're about finding land. They're about um, about debottlenecking grid congestion. They're about getting batteries and hydrogen in to, to reduce carbon um, to reduce cannibalization. However, our official forecast at the moment is that we will install 311 gigawatts worldwide in 2030, which will take world capacity to, I think it's about 3.2 terawatts. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we see growth, we see growth, but I, and I think there's a huge upside to growth. Um, I struggle to believe that it could be deployed perpetually at an exponential rate, not least because you end up with the whole world covered in solar panels. Um, Definitely growth. <laughs> Sorry, that was a long and very and very uncertain um, amount of talk. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, very insightful, very interesting. Maybe to, just to to pick on on this twenty thirty uh, because you know uh, the discussions and that's where we are coming from uh, at Solar Power Europe. The discussions at the European level currently are really uh, about this new target, this new renewables target, uh, which we're going to have until twenty thirty. The European Commission just recently proposed some uh, 40% to start the negotiations with. Uh, as I already said, we are aiming at 45%. Because uh, I, I couldn't agree more with you that, you know, in order to get us on track for hopefully still a 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario, we really need to go faster. Uh, but already, you know, looking at uh, what 40%, a 40% target could mean for us, uh, we reckon that uh, we would have some additional 520 gigawatts, uh, which we would uh, install in Europe by 2030. Um, and if you, if you, um, you know, just uh, look at what that would mean uh, in yearly additions, on average, 58 gigawatts a year, uh, and that's only the 40% target. Uh, and by the way, here also the European Commission is underestimating. Uh, completely what uh, we can do as a sector because in their uh, impact assessment when they look at 40 percent renewables they look at roughly 380 gigawatt of uh, solar installed by 2030 um, very much underestimating what we already do today because what, what we see is that this level would be reached already in 2025 2026 at the latest um, so Already that is a huge increase, 58 uh, gigawatt a year. Do you think this is uh, something which uh, which is realistic? It Already no no yeah. problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 58 so, uh, gigawatts a year doesn't sound like that So much I give you the other figure, 45% of renewables by 2030. What we are aiming for would be an additional 730 uh, gigawatt. I'm not uh, calculating that down to each and every year. Uh, but that's what we are aiming for, 730 gigawatt added. That would bring us to 45% of renewables. It's a lot. Still, no it seems doable. Side. Yeah, okay. I mean, Italy has installed... Sorry, Germany has installed 10 gigawatts in a year before. Hmm. So I, I don't necessarily see the problem with doing that, but it will require feet on the accelerator, probably policy and probably some not hitting roadmaps, not hitting roadblocks in multiple countries. At the moment, we've got Poland and the Netherlands going, growing quite strongly and doing, doing 58, 70 gigawatts a year. We'll need to be going a bit faster than we are today in more countries. Maybe as you already mentioned, a couple of countries, I wanted just to, to follow up on, uh, on on some of the markets. Because indeed, I mean, Germany, we, we just had elections, so it's very promising. So hopefully uh, Germany will go faster. But anyway, Germany has always been a market, at least in the last couple of years, which was very stable, uh, biggest market. But then there's been some surprises, Poland. Uh, do you see any other surprises coming up um, in the next couple of years? If I saw them, they wouldn't be surprises. Um, I would love, I would love to see them. <laughs> I think there'll be some Eastern European booms, probably. I'm not sure what countries are going to do it, but I think that Romania, Bulgaria, maybe Serbia, are thinking of doing, of going, of breaking out again. Spain's going to be big. I mean, all the power price at the moment, the power price crunch in Spain is helping companies sign PPAs at rates which make solar plants worth 
building. And that's acting against the, um, the, the countervailing effect of higher capex for solar. And I have no idea where the situation in Spain will end. The government plan, plans to put a lot of electrolyzer capacity in Spain to make hydrogen. So if that works out, that could give the, give the sector there some sustainability and prevent complete destruction of value for, of power prices there. So I think I would bet on Spain, on Portugal, on Eastern Europe for continued surprises. Mm -hmm. If they get it right in Spain with the measures they are currently envisaging uh, in order to counteract the high energy prices. So there's, uh, there's quite some uh, uh, nervousness in, in the Spanish market, I, I guess. Uh, but, but indeed, I mean, uh, th thanks very much for your, I mean, for your uh, views on, on these markets. We haven't touched on uh, 2050 yet, uh, as I was envisaging, but maybe that's anyway too far away and it's exciting to just stay, you know, with the next couple of years. Uh, you already mentioned a couple of challenges uh, ahead, like grid, I know that grid land, uh, potential cannibalization. I, I would like to turn to the company representatives again. You know, uh, what could be on our way to this huge potential? Uh, we see the growth we are, we are all envisaging and we all also need in order to uh, combat climate change. Uh, so what could, could hold us back on this path? Um, is it public acceptance? Is it permitting? What is it? Can I ask you, Andreas, first? Yes, I think, let's say, if we, uh, you already mentioned the German elections, and um, I really expect here in the next year already, uh, let's say, an increase of the market so that we come back to around about or even more of 10 gigawatt per year. But this means that we have, from my point of view, two big challenges. And this, I think, is in many markets the case. One is the bureaucracy. So we need less bureaucracy to, let's say, come fast to building permits, to uh, really building plants and site, uh, sites. This is the one point which we need to address to the policy to, to get speed to speed up. And the second big challenge is uh, the shortage of manpower. So when we are looking today into the market and to our customer base, the installers, they are all fully booked for the next three, four months. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say if we want to manage this growth and uh, want to double uh, uh, the market capacity per year, uh, then let's say we need to take actions to bring new companies, new players, new people into this market to make trainings, formations. And, and this is very important, I think. So already to start now doing it because building up this capacity takes time. Yeah, but in general, I see it uh, possible and we only need to start. What we are doing from SMA side, as an example, is our famous Solar Academy. So here we are also making a lot of trainings for, let's say, companies who want to restart um, in the solar business. And per year, we are doing worldwide uh, more than 300 trainings uh, to especially installers. And this is where I see also our, let's say, uh, where we bring in a benefit into the whole industry to to uh, train these people and bring them into our business. I couldn't agree more, Andrea. Skills is really a very, very important topic going forward. We're going to launch, uh, just for your information, uh, the Solar Works campaign uh, end of October, a uh, series of videos together with Google, uh, where we want to shed a light on indeed the opportunities, because we're looking at 4 million jobs potentially in our sector uh, by, by 2050. Uh, but then also to make sure that we also have these skills. Uh, so there will be a lot of uh, activities on our side as well on, on this topic. Gonzalo, would you agree with these two, uh, these two priorities, less bureaucracy, speeding it up and manpower? Uh, yes, sure. No, I would uh, definitely also add what Jane said to the grid. Um, but I couldn't agree more to you guys. I mean, also the, the numbers that Jenny uh, shared with us is quite impressive. I and mean, maybe you saw me smiling because, yeah, every time I hear that the market is growing for me, it's every year. And I've been in the industry now for 13 years. It's like, whoa, this sounds crazy. But then uh, Jenny's completely right. I mean, we had 10 gigawatts in Germany. When was it? 2010, 2011. So already 10 years ago. And then due to some political decisions, the markets slowed down a little bit, but now it's catching up. 
So it's 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 really amazing. I mean, we're definitely in the right industry, and uh, yeah, I think after this call, I have to buy some shares. But uh, <laughs> jokes jokes aside, I mean, I agree with with both of you. I mean, the grid is a very important issue. The grid stability can it uh, manage the peaks? Can it manage the imbalance between power production and uh, power consumption? And I think these are very very key questions that will come up or that have to come up or are already coming up. And they can be solved through storage systems, through intelligent grid, through artificial intelligence, which I'm sure will come in, in the future. And these are very interesting topics for us. And then also from, from our perspective as a module manufacturer, of course, uh, the and I think we discussed it at the beginning, is also the, how shall I say, the uh, costs, the, the supply shortage of some components. I mean, especially now, uh, silicon, which has been shortened, has given us a very hard time this year. Uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Jenny said before that it's, it's really a headache. Uh, for my next life, I will sell cars or stones. I don't know, but not uh, PV modules. This is just uh, crazy. And we're trying to solve this, obviously. This is something that bothers us a lot and that we're spending a lot of time, resources, and, and meetings by closing strategic um, partnerships um, with upper stream partners. And I mean, we will see the first results uh, already next year in Q2 latest. So this is giving or giving us a hard time. And then uh, I completely agree also with Andreas, shortage of manpower is an issue. The bureaucracy is an issue. I mean, every government also now you're talking about the German elections, everybody's talking about how important renewables are, you know? So I hope that it's not just a topic that the politicians and the parties used during the election period, you know, now that the elections are over, everybody goes back to, to their own business and forget this topic. But if we really want to increase and install uh, twice, triple the volume and reach this 40% target by 2030, I mean, also we need a lot of support. You also spoke about Spain, what's going on in Spain. Yeah, it's not very helpful, let's put it mildly. You know, this is again going a step back into the development of renewables. So I really don't understand how the government can go in this direction. I mean, we should learn from the influence that politics has on development of renewables and on renewables itself. You know, I, I really don't, I have a hard time understanding how a politician can say we support it, we want to develop it, and then one year later, oh no, let's go two steps back. This is this you know this is not good for industry. This is not good for investors. This is not good for the consumer. This is not good for anybody. So again, political support I think is is really very important. Not just to put a, a number on a board, say forty percent, and then you know let somebody else do the job. I mean we all have to we all have to work on this together to reach these targets. Mm -hmm. No one, uh, no one so far mentioned public acceptance going forward. Is this an issue? And I would just, you know, open up uh, the floor for everyone who wants to comment on this one. Um, is this an issue? And um, do your companies, you know, yeah, are, are your companies active in the, in this regard? Yeah, perhaps I may answer. Uh, let's say when I see the uh, energy transition in general we have solar and wind and i think the public acceptance is let's say where we need to work on is more on the wind side yeah i think here when i see the uh, central european markets there is the bigger challenge for the solar industry i think the the acceptance in uh, the society is already very high yeah there might be some challenges uh, when we go into the free field uh, applications uh, so let's say uh, 5 megawatt plus 10 50 megawatt then for sure we need to work on uh, during the development phase with local communities and and stakeholders um, this is definitely a challenge but i would say it's manageable and the solar industry and technology has a wide acceptance Mm -hmm. Any other views? Yeah, I completely agree with, with Andreas uh, on this one. And we hardly, I mean, we hardly hear from any partner that he has a, an issue with acceptance. Of course, it happens once in a while, but not very often. And uh, I think also differentiation between co uh, residential consumers where you have absolutely no questions and no, nobody being against it 
And of course, then when you put a, put a big uh, 10, 20, 100 megawatts uh, field, then there could be some issue. But again, I hear about this very, very seldom. More um, on wind, I agree. And this is, you know, I don't want to put wind as a negative thing. I think it's very important. The mixture of wind and solar for a country and biogas for, uh, should also be included there. But uh, yeah, this is something that we see in the press. I mean, I'm not involved in, in wind or Trina is not involved in wind, but this is an issue where we hear sometimes that there, the acceptance is not so high, but for solar, I can confirm it happens very, very seldom, hmm. at least in Europe. Okay, maybe to, to go back to one point you mentioned, Jenny, which is uh, cannibalization. When do you think that this challenge uh, is going to hit us uh, and, and how, how can it be overcome? I think in Spain it's going to start hitting us in the next five years, although this is a really bad time to start saying that because um, the, energy, the electricity prices in Spain are really high right now, uh, thanks to high carbon prices and high natural gas prices. It's already hitting California in a big way. California gets about 26% of its electricity from solar and solar makes about 30% less than base load or would theoretically make about 30% less for electricity than base load already. So there's, there's a big Im impact there. And I, I do think if Spain carries on building solar, it will be in that situation where you can't build any new solar because the power prices in the daytime are very low. Of course, we're also going to see more air conditioning added, which will, uh, and solar and air conditioning go very nicely together. Um, we'll see batteries, which can do um, shifting load to the evening. And honestly, batteries are coming on faster than I expected. So that, um, <laughs> hey, maybe this is a non-issue by the time, <laughs> by 2025. I, I, I also think we'll, we're going to need some, particularly in Northern Europe, we're going to need to look at the mixture. I mean, we, we didn't knock wind, and I don't want to knock wind because the wind blows in the winter, which if you're in Germany and the sun is not great in the winter, in fact, the sun is terrible in the winter. And that's also where you need a lot of your electricity, particularly if you've electrified heat, then we're gonna need wind and solar together. You cannot have a battery that stores power summer to winter. You can, you can have a battery that stores like two to four hours of power, no trouble, but I don't think we'll ever do seasonal storage. The number of cycles is just too small to amortize the cost. Um, so yeah, the solutions are mixing energy resources, making people run their air con in the, in the daytime if you can, and, and ideally getting them to switch it off in the evening because the house stays cool. Um, batteries and electrolyzers. Okay. Any, any other comments to this? Not for me. <laughs> okay, I, I don't uh, see other ones also. Uh, I don't see any one of the others also uh, chipping in. So I, I think we have uh, really shed uh, a very good light on all the challenges ahead, but I want to end with a positive note. Uh, so a question to, to all of you, uh, when do you, think that uh, you know the latest uh, or maybe you know just a guess because we've been uh, we've been talking about uh, all the big uh, solar numbers by 2030 and uh, and to some extent we we all don't know yet but maybe just to get a, a feeling from you where you see solar uh, being in in Europe to just to uh, to make it a little bit more uh, cozy in Europe by 2030. Yeah, if, if, if I may... And it can be ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly speaking, I'm, I'm, I don't want to give you a number so, or whatever, but as was said in, in the previous, uh, in the previous, uh, uh, from the previous guests, uh, clearly the energy mix is the key, you know, because you have several conditions. So uh, generally speaking, renewable are going to be the, the pillar of the production. That, that, that's for sure. So, and, and, and the growth is going to be exponential because what we are saying is that more or less everything that we should do is clear. What is unclear right now is the speed in which we, we, should, we should apply those kind of strategy. That, that's more or less the, 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 the main topic. Uh, we know where, where, where we have to go. We know how we should accelerate. Yeah. 
<clears throat> then I would like to jump in and uh, let's say where do your question was, where do we see solar in 2030? I would say that in comparison to, to today, the market will at least will be tripled in the European Union. So this is my expectation for 2030. And to come to this tripling of the market, and here I see an important role as uh, when I speak for SMA as a leading technology provider and technology company, this is that we are have some steps in front of us. This is on the one hand, the sector coupling means uh, storage, uh, e-mobility, uh, hydrogen, uh, grid management, energy management functions need to be integrated on all levels, means from home applications to business to utility scale applications. And this is what we are already doing and working on, but this has to be really intensified. And uh, especially hydrogen as an, as an energy carrier will also play an important role. So, um, and this is also where we are stepping in in this field as SMA and um, yeah we we need to bring these technologies to the decision makers and also make it uh, make let's say everybody in the industry but especially also in the industry aware of these uh, technological uh, possibilities we have already today and we need to implement them in all these fields and uh, this um, I think is also a to-do we need we have in front of us as an industry to make everybody aware of the technological solutions we already have today. Thanks a lot, Andreas. Jenny, would you want to go next? Well, I have an absolute answer because we have a 2030 forecast. So <laughs> there's going to be cumulative solar capacity in Europe of 457.4 gigawatts in 2030 and a build rate of about by then about 35 gigawatts a year and a, a run rate of about 25 gigawatts. So yes, yeah, that was very clear to the point. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. We can beat that. <laughs> Good. We, we are aiming at that, indeed, to beat it. <laughs> and we, Gonzalo. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a little bit surprised. I mean, we, we see already for next year. I mean, if I understood it correctly, Jenny, we see Atrina already for next year in Europe, 36 to 38 gigawatts, and this is 2022. So for hopefully we're not too, too optimistic. If, of course, it depends on what happens in Spain, um, but we're very, very optimistic. And then I would rather I, uh, join Andreas uh, by saying that probably by 2030, we will have the triple uh, installed per year. Uh, not only because uh, I work at Trina, but this is really what we see on the growth. I mean, we see also the consumption of energy is growing uh, with e-cars, as Andreas mentioned, and e-bikes and what well, everything. We're more people in Europe. and. This is, uh, we see a tremendous growth. I, I hope that by 2030, we will not see any nuclear energy anymore. So this has to be covered then, of course, by solar, by uh, wind, by bio, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is also linked to the question we had before about the acceptance of the public. And I think the public in Europe, you know, five years from now, they will, I don't want to say they, they will not understand why we still use coal or oil and nuclear. Um, you know, the, the trend goes very, very clearly towards renewables, and uh, this is where, where the investments are going to go. So this is what we're so positive about 2030, no doubt at all. And that's a perfect closing remark, Gonzalo, <laughs> with this very positive outlook from, from, from your side. You. It was a, really a great pleasure, and I mean it, uh, discussing with all of you. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for sharing your, your thoughts. Thanks you, dear audience, for joining in. Um, and uh, again, I can just invite you, as I did in the beginning, if you have any questions to Trina, who was organizing this, um, you can leave them in the comment section on LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook. Uh, and the colleagues of Trina will be answering you during the live Q&A session tomorrow. Um, I wish you all a uh, very nice InterSolo. Enjoy the rest uh, of InterSolo and maybe see some of you also um, in, uh, in, the different, uh, in front of the different booths or at, uh, at a conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>